What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Dave Reed's Twilight. Um, just trying to black and white today. Yeah, but why not, you know? But today I am going to be reading chapter 2 for you guys. Maybe chapter 3 later on today. My phone recharges. Um, quick recap of what happened in chapter 1. This girl named Isabella Swan came to a town called Forks. Uh, her father is Charlie, who is also the chief of police in Forks. It's always raining in Forks. Um, her dad bought her a new truck. Oh, an old truck from the 50s, but it's new to her. <laughs> uh, her first day, she went to school for the first day in Forks. Um, well, it was normal first days, it goes terribly wrong. <laughs> So, yeah, she meets the Collins, or not actually meets them, except for Edward, who just glares at her, really. And that towards the end of the chapter, he tries to get out of the class that she's in. And, uh, that's pretty much it. So let's dive on into chapter two. That's another long one, which will probably be split in half on my cell phone, but we'll see. All right. Chapter 2. Where are you? Ah, oh, here we go. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Alright, chapter 2. Open book. See? The book is open. Fun. Um, hmm. The next day was better and worse. It was better because it wasn't raining yet. Though well, the clouds were dense and opaque. It was easier because I knew what to expect in my day. Mike came to visit me in, Eng in English and walked me to my next class, with chess club Eric glaring at him all the while. That was flattering. People didn't look at me quite as much as they did yesterday. I sat with a big group at lunch that included Mike, Eric, Jessica, and several other people whose names and faces I now remembered. The friend Angela. I began to feel like I was treading water instead of drowning in it. It was worse because I was tired. I still couldn't sleep with the wind echoing around the house. It was worse because Mr. Varner called on me in trig when my hand wasn't raised and I had the wrong answer. It was miserable because I had to play volleyball and the one time I didn't cringe out of the way of the ball, I hit my teammate in the head with it. I've actually got a worse story. I was playing volleyball in high school and I went to go Bike it like that? Let's just say they never trust me with a volleyball again. Because I ended up shattering one of the light bulbs from the ceiling lights. So yeah. They never let me play um, volleyball after they let me play, but they're like, hmm, can you try not to aim at Scott? Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, uh And it was worse because Edward Cullen wasn't in school at all. All morning I was dreading lunch, fearing his bizarre glares. Part of me wanted to confront him and demand to know what his problem was. While I was laying sleepless in my bed, I even imagined what I would say, but I knew myself too well to think I would really have the guts to do it. I made the coward lion look like the Terminator. But when I walked into the cafeteria of Jessica, trying to keep my eyes from sweeping the place for him, and failing entirely, I saw that his four siblings of sorts were sitting together at the same table, and he was not with them. Mike intercepted us and steered us to his table. Jessica seemed elated by the attention, and her friends quickly joined us. As I tried to listen to their easy chatter, I was terribly uncomfortable, waiting nervously for the moment he would arrive. I hoped that he would simply ignore me when he came, and prove my suspicions false. He didn't come. And as time passed, I grew more and more tense. I walked to biology with more confidence when, by the end of lunch, he still hadn't shown. Showed. Mike, who was taken on the qualities of a golden retriever, walked faithfully by my side to class. I held my breath at the door, and Edward Cullen wasn't there either. I exhaled and went to my seat. Mike followed, talking about an upcoming trip to the beach. He lingered by my desk to the bedroom. Then he smiled at me wistfully and went to, my, to sit by a girl with braces and a bad perm. 
it looked like I was going to have to do something about mining. No one to be easing. In a town like this, where everyone lived on top of everyone else, diplomacy was essential. I had never been enormously tactful. I had no practice dealing with overly friendly boys. Uh, I was relieved I had the desk to myself, that Edward was absent. I told myself that repeatedly. But I couldn't get rid of the nagging suspicion that I was the reason he wasn't there. It was ridiculous and egotistical to think that I could affect anyone in that strong way. It was impossible, and yet I couldn't stop worrying that it was true. When the school day was finally done and the blush was fading out of my cheeks from the volleyball incident, I changed quickly back into my jeans and navy blue sweater. I hurried from the girl's locker room, pleased to find that I successfully evaded my to find that I had successfully evaded my retriever friend for the moment. I walked swiftly out to the parking lot. I was crowded now with fleeing students. I got my truck and dug through the bag to make sure I had what I needed. Last night, I discovered that Charlie couldn't cook much besides fried eggs and bacon. Yum yum. So I requested that I could be assigned kitchen detail for the duration of my stay. He was willing enough to hand over the keys to the banquet hall. I also found out that he had no food in the house. So, I had my shopping list and the cash from the jar in the cupboard labeled food money. No want, and I was on my way to the thrift player. I gunned my deafening engine to life. Ignoring the heads that turned in my direction, and I acted carefully until they placed up in the line of cars that were waiting to exit the parking lot. As I waited, trying to pretend that the ear-splitting rumble was coming from someone else's car, I saw the two Colons and the Hale twins getting into the car. It was a shiny new Volvo. Of course, I hadn't noticed their clothes before. I'd been too mesmerized by their faces. Now that I looked, it was obvious that they were all, well, all dressed exceptionally well. Simply, but in clothes that subtly hinted at designer origins. With the remarks, with the remarkable good looks, the style with which they carried themselves, they could have worn dish rags and still pulled it off. It seemed excessive for them to have both looks and money. But, as far as I could tell, life worked that way most of the time. It didn't look as if I, it brought any of them, brought them any acceptance here. No, I don't fully believe that. The isolation must be their desire. I couldn't imagine any door that wouldn't be opened by that degree of beauty. Now, I, I second that. They looked at my noisy truck as I passed them, just like everyone else. I kept my eyes straight forward and was relieved when I finally was free of school grounds. The thrift way was not far from the school. It was a few streets south, off the highway. It was nice to be inside the supermarket. It felt normal. I did the shopping at home, and I fell into a pattern of the familiar task of Adelaide. The store was big enough inside that I couldn't hear the tapping in the rain on the roof to remind me of where I was. When I got home, I unloaded all the groceries, stuffing them in wherever I could find an open space. I hoped Charlie wouldn't mind. I wrapped potatoes in foil and stuffed them in the oven to bake, covered a steak in the marinade, and balance it on top of the carton of eggs in the fridge. When I was finished with that, I took my book bag upstairs. Before I started my homework, I changed into a dry pair, pair of dry sweats. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try to edit that part up, but probably not. I took a pony and checked my email for the first time. I had three messages. Bella, my mom wrote, write me as soon as you get in. Tell me how your flight was. Is it raining? I miss you already. I'm almost finished packing for Florida, but I can't find my pink blouse. Do you know where I put it? Phil says hi. Mom. I sighed and went to the next. It was sent eight hours after the first. Bella, she wrote. Why haven't you emailed me yet? What are you waiting for? Mom. The last one was from this morning. Isabella, if I haven't heard anything from you by 5.30 p.m. today, I'm calling Charlie. I checked the clock. I still had an hour, but my mom was well known for jumping the gun. Mom, calm down. I'm writing right now. Don't do anything rash. Bella. I sent that and began again. Mom, everything is great. Of course it's raining. I was waiting for somebody to write something to write about. School isn't bad, just a little repetitive. I met some nice kids who sit by me at lunch. 
Your blouse is at the dry cleaners. You were supposed to pick it up Friday. Charlie bought me a truck. Can you believe it? I love it. It's old, but really sturdy. Which is good, you know, for me. I miss you too. I'll write, you, I'll write again soon. But I'm not going to check my email every five minutes. Relax, breathe. I love you. Bella. I decided to read Wuthering Heights, the novel we were currently studying in English, yet again for the fun of it. And that's what I was doing when Charlie came home. I lost track of time and I hurried downstairs to take the potatoes out and put the steak into broil. Who broil steak? Bella, my father called out when he heard me on the stairs. Who else? I thought to myself. Hey dad, welcome home. Thanks. He hung up his gun belt and stepped out of his boots as I bustled around about the kitchen. As far as I was aware, he'd never shot the gun on the job. But he kept it ready. When I came here as a child, he would always remove the bullets as soon as he walked in the door. I guess he considered me old enough now not to shoot myself by accident. And not depressed enough to shoot myself on purpose. What's for dinner? He asked warily. My mother was an imaginative cook. And her experience, experiments weren't always edible. I was surprised and sad that he seemed to remember that far back. Steak and potatoes, I answered. He looked relieved. He seemed to feel awkward standing in the kitchen doing nothing. He lumbered into the living room to watch TV while I worked. We were both more comfortable that way. I made a salad while the steaks cooked and set the table. I called him in when dinner was ready and he sniffed appreciatively as he walked into the room. Smells good, Bill. Thanks. We ate in silence for a few minutes. It wasn't uncomfortable. Neither of us were just bothered by the choir. In some ways, we were still we were well suited for living together. So, how did you like the new school? Or how did you like school? Have you made any? Mm, sorry. So, how do you like school? Have you made any friends? He asked as he was taking seconds. Well, I have a few friends with a girl named Jessica. A few classes with a girl named Jessica. I sit with her friends at lunch. And there's this boy, Mike, who's very friendly. Everybody seems pretty nice. With one without one, one outstanding exception. That must be Mike Newton. Nice kid, nice family. His dad owns a sporting goods store out, just outside of town. He makes a good living off all the backpackers who come through here. Do you know the Cullen family? I asked hesitantly. Dr. Cullen's family? Sure. Dr. Cullen's a great man. They, the kids, are a little different. They don't seem to fit in very well at school. Charlie surprised me by looking angry. People in this town. Dr. Cullen is a brilliant surgeon who could probably work in any hospital in the world, make ten times the salary he gets here. He continued getting louder. We're lucky to have him. Lucky that his wife wants to live in a small town. He's an asset to the community, and all those kids are well-behaved and polite. I had my doubts when they first moved in with all these adopted teenagers. I thought we might have some problems with them. They're all very mature. I haven't had one speck of trouble from any of them. That's more than I can say for the children of some folks who have lived in this town for generations. And they stick together the way a family should. Camping trips every other weekend. Just because they're newcomers, people have to talk. It was the longest speech I'd ever heard Charlie make. <laughs> he must feel strongly about whatever people were saying. I backpedaled. They seemed nice enough to me. I just noticed they kept to themselves. They're all very attractive, I added, trying to be more complimentary. <laughs> you should see the doctor, Charlie said, laughing. It's a good thing he's happily married. A lot of the nurses at the hospital have a hard time concentrating on their work around with him around. We lapsed back into silence as we finished eating. He cleared the table while I started on the dishes. He went back to the TV and after I finished washing watching the dishes by hand, no dishwasher, I went upstairs unwillingly to work on my math homework, and I could feel a tradition in the making. That night it was finally quiet. I fell asleep quickly, exhausted. The rest of the week was uneventful. I got used to the routine of my classes. By Friday I was able to recognize, if not name, Almost all the students at my school. And Jim, the kids on my team, learned not to pass me the ball and to step quickly in front of me 
if the other team tried to take advantage of my weakness. I happily stayed out of their way. Edward Cullen did not come back to school, or didn't come back to school. Every day, I watched anxiously until the rest of the Cullens entered the cafeteria without him. And then I could mostly relax, then I could relax and join in the, uh, join in the lunch room time conversation. Mostly, it centered around a trip to La Push Ocean Park in two weeks that Mike was putting together. I was invited, and I had agreed to go. More out of politeness than desire. Beaches should be hot and dry. By Friday, I was perfectly comfortable entering my biology class. No longer worried that Edward would be there. For all I knew, he had dropped out of school. I tried not to think about him, but I couldn't totally suppress the worry that I was responsible for his continued absence. Ridiculous as it seemed. My first weekend in Forks passed without incident. Charlie, unused to spending time in the usually empty house, worked most of the weekend. I cleaned the house, got ahead on my homework, and I wrote my mom a more bogusly cheerful email. I did the drive to, to the library Saturday. Mm -hmm. Ugh, sorry for the yawns again. I did drive to the library Saturday, but it was so poorly stocked that I did not bother to get a car. I thought to make a date with to visit Olympia or Seattle, so I didn't find a good bookstore. I wondered idly what kind of gas lines that truck got, and shuddered at the thought. Well, a truck from the 50s, I assume not that great. <laughs> Maybe by 12 miles a gallon or whatnot. People greeted me in the parking lot Monday morning. I didn't know all of their names. I waved back and smiled at everybody, at everyone. It was colder this morning, but happily not raining. In English, Mike took his accustomed seat by me. We had a pop quiz on Weathering Heights. It was straightforward, very easy. All in all, I was feeling a lot more comfortable than I thought I would feel by this point. More comfortable than I ever have ever expected to feel here. When we walked out of class, the air was full of swirling bits of white. I could hear people shouting excitement, excitedly to each other. The wind bit at my cheeks, my nose. Wow, my note, Mike said. It's snowing. I looked a little at the little cotton fluffs that were building along the sidewalk. It was radically past my face. Ew. Ew. Snow. That, that wasn't my good day. It was fresh. Don't you like snow? No. That means it's too cold. No. That means it's too cold for rain. Obviously. Besides, I thought it was supposed to come down in like flakes. You know. Each one unique and all that. These just look like the ends of Q-tips. Haven't you ever seen Snowfall before? He asked incredulously. Sure I have, I paused. On TV. Mike laughed. And then a big squishy ball of dripping snow smacked into the back of my head. Who is head. We both turned around to see where it came from. I had my suspicions about Eric. who was walking away, his back towards us in the wrong direction for his next class. Mike apparently had the same notion. He bent over and began scraping together a pile of white mush. I'll see you at lunch, okay? I kept walking as I spoke. Once people start throwing wet stuff, I go inside. He just nodded his eyes on Eric's retreating figure. Throughout the morning, everybody chattered excited to him. About the snow. Apparently, it was the first snowfall of the new year. I kept my mouth shut. Sure, it was drier than rain, until it melted your so into your socks. I walked alertly, alertly to the class for to the cafeteria with Jessica, after Spanish. Mush balls were flying everywhere. Snowballs, it's not mush balls, it's snowballs, alright? Uh, I kept a binder in my hands, ready to use as a shield if necessary. Jessica thought it was hilarious, but something in my expression kept her from lobbing a snowball at me herself. Mike caught up to us as we walked into the doors, laughing, with ice melting the spikes in his hair. He and Jessica were talking animatedly about the snow fight as we got into the line by f to buy food. I glanced toward the table in the corner of the habit, and then I froze where I stood. There were five people at the table. Jessica pulled my on my arm. Hello, Bella, what do you want? I looked down, my ears were hot. I had no reason to feel self-conscious, I reminded myself. If I hadn't done anything wrong, 
I hadn't done anything wrong. What's with Bella? Mike asked Jessica. Nothing, I answered. I'll just get soda today. I caught up at the end of the line. Aren't you hungry? Jessica asked. Actually, I feel a little sick, I said. My eyes still on the floor. I waited for them to get their food and then followed them to a table, my eyes on my feet. I sipped my soda slowly, my stomach churning. Twice Mike asked, with unnecessary concern, how I was feeling. I told him it was nothing, but I was wondering if I should play it up and escape to the nurse's office for the next hour. Ridiculous. I shouldn't have to run away. I decided to permit one myself one glance at the Cohen family's table. If he was glaring at me, I would skip my biology, like the coward I was. I kept my head down and glanced up under my lashes. None of them were looking this way. I lifted my head a little. They were laughing. Edward, Jasper, and Emmett all had their entire her entirely saturated with melting snow. Alice and Rosalie were leaning away as Emmett shook his dripping hair toward them. They were enjoying a snowy day, just like everyone else. Only, they looked more like a scene from a movie than the rest of us. But, aside from their laughter and playfulness, there was something different. And I couldn't quite pinpoint what the difference was. I examined Edward the most carefully. His skin was less pale, I decided. Flush from the snow fight, fight maybe. The circles under his eyes were much less noticeable. But there was something more. I pondered, staring, trying to isolate the change. Bella, what are you staring at? Just intruded. And I was following my stare. At that precise moment, his eyes flashed over to meet mine. I dropped my head, letting my hair fall to conceal my face. I was sure, though, in the instant our eyes met, that he didn't look harsh or unfriendly, as he had last time. I'd seen him. He looked merely, curi mere, merely curious again, unsatisfied in any way, in some way. Edward Cohen is staring at you. Just a giggle in my ear. He doesn't look angry, does he? I couldn't help asking. No, she said, sounding confused by my question. Should he be? I don't think he likes me. I confided. I still felt un. I still felt queasy. I put my head down on my arm. The Collins don't like anybody. Well, they don't notice anybody enough to like them. But he's still staring at you. Stop looking at him. I hissed. She snickered, but she looked away. I raised my head enough to make sure that she did. Contemplating violence as she resisted. Eh, hey, nah, Bell. Ain't no reason to resort to violence, okay? Mike interrupted us then. He was playing an epic battle of the blizzard in the parking lot. Of the blizzard in the parking lot. After school, and wanted us to join. Jessica agreed enthusiastically. The way she looked at Mike felt left a little doubt. As she would be up for anything, he suggested. I kept silent. I'd have to hide in the gym until the parking lot cleared. For the rest of the lunch hour, I decided to ask very carefully. Kept my eyes at my own table. I decided to earn my other bargain I'd made with myself. Since he didn't look angry, I would go to biology. My stomach did frighten the little flips at the thought of sitting next to him again. I didn't really want to talk. I really didn't, uh, sorry. I didn't really want to walk to class with Mike as usual. He seemed to be a popular target for the snowball snipers. But when we went to the door, everyone besides me groaned in unison. It was raining. Washing all traces of snow away in the in clear icy ribbons down the side of this walkway. I pulled my hood up secretly pleased. I'd be free to go straight home after a gym. Mike kept up a string of compliments on the way to building floor four. Once inside the classroom, I saw with relief that my table was still empty. Mr. Barron was walking out of the class room, around the room, sorry, distributing one microscope and a box of slides and by the slides, kind to each table. Class didn't start for a few minutes. The room buzzed with conversation. I kept my eyes away from the door. Doing idly on the cover of my notebook. I had very clearly 
I heard very clearly when the chair next to me moved. But my eyes stayed carefully and focused on the pattern I was drawing. How the hell? Hang on. Hello. I had a quiet musical voice. I looked up, stunned that he was speaking to me. He was sitting as far away from me as the desk allowed, but his chair was angled toward me. His hair was dripping wet and disheveled, even so. He looked like he'd just finished shooting a commercial for hair gel. His dazzling face was friendly, open, a slight smile on his flawless lips. But his eyes were careful. <clears throat> My name is Edward Cullen, he continued. I didn't have a chance to introduce myself last week. You must be Bella Swan. My mind was spinning with confusion. Had I made up the whole thing? He was perfectly polite now. At his speak, he was waiting. But I couldn't think of anything conventional to say. How, how did you know my name? I stammered. He laughed a soft, enchanting laugh. Oh, I think everyone knows your name. The whole town's been waiting for you to arrive. I grimaced. I knew it was something like that. No, I persisted, persisted stupidly. I meant, why did you call me Bella? He seemed confused. Do you prefer Isabel? Do you prefer, yeah. Damn, doing his voice is kind of hard. <laughs> Do you prefer Isabella? No, I like Bella. I like Bella, I said. But I think Charlie, I mean, my dad, must call me Isabella behind my back. That's what everyone here seems to know me as. I tried to explain, feeling like an utter moron. Oh, you let it drop. I was away awkwardly. Thankfully, Mr. Banner started the class at that moment. I tried to concentrate as he explained the lab we would be doing today. The slides in the box were out of order. Yeah, figure. Working as lab partners, we had to separate the slides of onion root tip cells and the phases of mitosis. They were re represented, or they. Re Working as lab partners, we had to create, or we had to separate the slides of onion root tip cells into the phases of mitosis they were represented and label them accordingly. We weren't supposed to use our books. In 20 minutes, he would come, be coming around to see who had it right. Get started, he commanded. Ladies, <clears throat> ladies first, partner, Edward asked. I looked up to see him smiling a crooked smile so beautiful that I could only stare at him like an idiot. Or, I could start, if you wish. The smile faded. He was obviously wondering if I was mentally confident. No, I said, flushing. I'll go ahead. I was showing off, just a little. I'd already done this lab. And I knew what I was looking for. It should be easy. I snapped the first slide into place under the microscope and adjusted it quickly to the 40x or 40 times objective. I studied the slide briefly. My assessment was confident. Prophase. Do you mind if I look? <clears throat> Do you mind if I look? He asked. As I began to remove the slide, his hand caught mine to stop me as he asked. His fingers were ice cold, like he'd been holding them up in a snowdrift before class. But that wasn't why I jerked my hand away so quickly. When he touched me, it stung my hand as if an electric current had passed through us. I'm sorry. He muttered, pulling his hand back immediately. However, he continued to reach for the microscope. I watched him, still staggered, as he s examined the slide for an even shorter time than I had. Prophase, he agreed, writing it neatly on the first space on our, on our work sheet, worksheet. He swiftly switched out the first slide for a second, and then glanced at it curiously. Anaphrase. Anaphrase, he murmured. He murmured. Writing it down as he spoke. I kept my voice, more well, my voice, indifferent. May I? He smirked and pushed the microscope to me. I looked through the eyepiece eagerly, only to be disappointed. Dang it, he was right. Slide three. I held out my hand without looking at him. He handed it to me. It seemed like he was being careful not to touch my skin again. I took the most fleeting look I could manage. Interface, interface. 
I passed him the microscope before he could ask for it. He took a sweet, a swift peek, and then wrote it down. I would have written it while he looked, but his clear, elegant script immediately intimidated me. I didn't want to spoil the page with my clumsy scrawl. We were finished before anyone else was even close. Was close. I could see Mike and his partner comparing two slides again and again. And another group had their books open underneath the table. Which left me with nothing to do but try not to look at him. Unsuccessfully. I glanced up and he was staring at me. The same inexplicable like frustration in his eyes. Suddenly I noticed, suddenly I identified the subtle difference in his face. Did you get contacts? I blurted out unthinkingly. He seemed puzzled by my unexpected question. No. Oh, I mumbled. I thought there was something different about your eyes. He shrugged and then looked away. In fact, I was sure there was something different. I vividly remembered the flat black color of his eyes the last time he glared at me. The color was striking against the background of his pale skin and his auburn hair. Today, his eyes were a completely different color. A strange, osher, osher, darker than butterscotch. I'm not sure how to pronounce that word, O-C-H-E-R, but that's how I think it was, osher or osher. I didn't understand how that could be. Unless he was just lying for some reason about the context. Or... Maybe Forks was making me crazy in the literal sense of the word. I looked down. His hands were clenched into hard fists again. Mr. Banner came to our table then to see why we weren't working. He looked over our shoulders to glance at the completed lab and then stared more intently at the check to check answers. So, Edward, didn't you think Isabella should get a chance with the microscope? Mr. Banner asked. <clears throat> Bella, Edward can correct it automatically. Actually, she identified three of the five. Mr. Banner looked at me now. His expression was skeptical. Have you done this lab before? He asked. I smiled sheepishly. Not with onion root. Whitefish, blast, tula. Yeah. Mr. Banner nodded. Were you in an advanced placement program in Phoenix? Yes. Well, after he said after a moment, well, I guess it's good you two are lab partners. He mumbled something else as he walked away. After he left, I began doodling on my notebook again. It's too bad about the snow, isn't it? Edward asked. I had a feeling that he was forcing himself to make small talk with me. Paranoia swept over me again. It was like he had heard my conversation with Jessica at lunch, and he was trying to prove something. Or, and he was trying to prove me wrong. Not really, I answered honestly, instead of pretending to be normal like everyone else. I was still trying to dislodge that stupid feeling of suspicion, and I couldn't concentrate. You don't like the cold. It wasn't a question. Or the wet. Forks must be a difficult place for you to live, he mused. You have no idea, I muttered darkly. He looked fascinated by what I had said. By what I said. For some reason, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine. For some reason, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> His face was such a distraction that I couldn't. I tried not to look at that. Any more than courtesy absolutely demanded. Why did you come here then? No one had asked me that. Not straight out like he did, demanding. It's complicated. I, I think I can keep up. He pressed. I paused for a long moment, and then made the mistake of meeting his gaze. His dark old eyes confused me, and I answered without thinking. My mother got remarried. I said, that doesn't sound so complex. He disagreed, but he was suddenly sympathetic. When did that happen? Last September. My voice sounds sad, even to me. <clears throat> and you don't like him, Edward surmised. 
His tongue stuck on. No, Bill's fine. Too young, maybe, but he's nice enough. Why didn't you want to stay with him? Why didn't you stay with him? I couldn't fathom his interest, but he continued to stare at me with penetrating eyes, as my dull life story was somehow vitally important. Phil travels a lot. He plays, with, he plays ball for a living. I half smiled at him. <laughs> Have I heard of him? He asked, smiling response. Probably not. He doesn't play well. Strictly minor league. league. He moves around a lot. Your mother sent you here so that she could travel with him. He said it was as an assumption again, not a question. My chin raised a fraction. No, she did not send me here. I sent myself. His eyebrows knit together. I don't understand, he admitted. And he seemed unnecessarily frustrated by that fact. I sighed. Why was I explaining this to him? He continued to stare at me with obvious curiosity. She stayed with me at first, but she missed him. It made her unhappy. So I decided it was time to spend some quality time with Charlie. My voice was glum, was glum by the time I finished. But now you're unhappy. He pointed out. And, I challenged. That doesn't seem fair. He shrugged. But his eyes were still intense. I left without humor. Hasn't anyone ever told you? Life isn't fair. I believe I have heard that somewhere before. He agreed dryly. So that's all, I insisted. Wondering why he is still staring at me that way. His gaze became appraising. You put on a good show, he said slowly. But I'd be willing to bet that you're suffering more than you let anyone see. I grimaced at him, resisting the impulse to stick out my tongue like a five <laughs> sticking out my tongue like a five year old, and looked away. <clears throat> Am I wrong? I tried to ignore him. I didn't think so. I didn't think so. He murmured slightly, smugly. Why does it matter to you? I asked, irritated. Irritated. I kept my eyes away, watching the teacher make his rounds. That's a very good question. He muttered.